Rise, rise, rise. Right here? F5. F5. <laughs> Thank you. You're, you are a co-author. Co-author. Oh yes. I the man. No, she's the man. The purpose of this paper is to show how propaganda is spread via visual communication in the United States, and that's why I said Professor Kramer already stole my thunder. Um, propagandistic uses of visual media have become so pervasive that one may assume that all visual communication is propaganda to a lesser or greater degree. Phenomena labeled propaganda no longer signify a uniform, a unique form of visual communication. In other words, visual communication is synonymous with propaganda. This conclusion is drawn from anecdotal evidence in American popular culture and supported by phenomenological analysis of visual experience. To paraphrase a marketing website, propaganda is image weaponized. Weaponized. <laughs> right from the website. It's really good. Right. The Agora. Persuasion and its more virulent form, propaganda, are a natural consequence of pluralism, or diversity of perspectives. Such diversity was accommodated in ancient Greece by the circle of governing citizens, or polis, such as the Agora in Athens depicted in this drawing. The polis privileged property male citizens to argue on, in public on their own behalf and to persuade their neighboring citizens on issues of the day. Persuasion in Greek democracy was an obligation of citizenship and an essential skill for maintaining one's property and standing in the community. Thus, from its very beginning, the social purpose of persuasion was to balance interests of the individual with the interests of the collective. To be political was to be persuasive. School of Athens, famous fresco in the Vatican by Raphael. This depicts Greek philosophers using rhetoric to pursue knowledge. Rhetorical eloquence was not granted equally to Greek citizens. So disadvantaged members of the polis sought help where they could find it. They hired itinerant teachers known as sophists, who were expert in persuasive rhetoric. The sophists were the first European communications consultants. They believed that persuasion performs an essential function of helping to maintain social cohesion. Protagoras was the most famous sophist. Protagoras had faith in the collective wisdom of the polis. He trained his students to argue from multiple points of view, because only debate and argumentation of malleable minds will reveal facts and conditions necessary for the virtuous life and for sound public policy. Protagoras and the other sophists challenge the prevailing belief in an objective universe founded on ultimate truths. Protagoras said, humans are the measure of all things, meaning that the objective universe is only accessible through human understanding and is negotiated in the polis. Plato and Aristotle, they did not like this at all. Plato's on the left holding his Timaeus, and Aristotle on the right is holding his ethics. They abhorred the sophists because they believed that the universe was ruled by absolute truths and logic and not settled by a debate in the Agora. The purpose of human beings was not to obtain the wisdom necessary, was to obtain 
the wisdom necessary to divine the absolute truths. To Plato and Aristotle, the sophists were con artists who made money by sham wisdom, selling out knowledge to the highest bidder. This negative connotation has survived for the word sophistry. Rhetoric, we're all familiar with Aristotle's formulation for rhetoric based on eternal logic. The source, ethos, the message, logos, and the emotions of the audience, pathos. Aristotle recognized the facts and events outside the control of the speaker, a technoi, I think is how you say that, uh, also impact the speaker's ability to do, persuade. This influential treatise dating from the fourth century before the Common Era has framed Western understanding of communication for 24 centuries. It understands persuasion as a speech act which reduces the persuasive potential of the visual spectacle to the speaker's own appearance and gestures. Jean Kepser, no, School of Athens, back to the rock stars. The ancient struggle between these two epistemologies, Protagoras's democratic pluralism and Aristotle's elitist absolutism is late in the evolution of human awareness. Protagoras's democratic pluralism, Aristotle's elitist absolutism. It's much more than an ancient academic debate. The clash between the democratic way of thinking and the absolutist way of thinking will come to frame ideological struggles of modern politics, of course, as well as our own understanding of propaganda. Jean Gebser shined a little light on this. According to this French cultural anthropologist, both Greek definitions of persuasion, sophist debate and Aristotelian logic, are late in the evolution of human awareness. Gebser says that the Greek art of persuasion spurred a mutation, a sudden eruption of human consciousness known as the mental structure, which fully blossomed during the Italian Renaissance and which persists to this day. Mental consciousness relies on vision, but it is primarily discursive in nature primarily dependent on words, marked by three-dimensional, egocentric, perspectival thinking, abstraction, and divisiveness. According to Gebser, rationalism, such as is caused by Plato and Aristotle, is a deficient form of the mental structure because it denies prior mutations of consciousness. In other words, it denies how thinking used to be the mythic and the magic. The mythic structure is circular, two-dimensional, polar, collective, envisioning the primal stories of ancestral worship, and in its deficient form manifested in the spoken myth. Magic consciousness is one-dimensional, spaceless, timeless, egoless, mouthless, immersed in nature and bound to the clan, manifested by the casting of spells to evoke the magical specter. Mental, mythic, magic. Notice mouthless. Gebser says that during the unleashing of visual media in the 20th century, through which he lived about half, Mental consciousness began to mutate into what he calls integral consciousness, and that the visual media are helping to accelerate the new upsurge, the new mutation. Integral consciousness reintegrates deficient rationalism with long lost mythic and magic structures into what he called a diaphanous presence, presence a see through, where you can see through to the past consciousness. A form of 
a four-dimensional, aspatial, atemporal mode of awareness. Gebser's integral consciousness gives us a framework for understanding the visual media as simultaneously mental, mythical, magical forms of propaganda that short-circuit rational appeals of mental consciousness, penetrate psychological manipulation of the psyche, surpass mythological ancestral worship, and tap into the magical presence. Now, uh, Gebser did philology as one way to investigate prehistorical consciousness before the human record, connecting, finding the traces of connections in language itself. Our language re retains such vestigial traces and can provide clues to links with the past. Etymological investigations link the me mechanistic visual mass media with the power of magic. The words make, machine, might, and magic all derive from a common Indo-European root. Is it ma? Ah, ah, ma, ma, ma. I have to refer to my teacher. From a linguistic perspective, the media machine has assumed the function of the tribal shaman. From its beginnings in cave paintings, and this is an exhibit um, for the Lascaux paintings, a modern representation where they've taken images of the, of the cave paintings at Lascaux in France and made an exhibit to go along with the real thing when you go visit. Because uh, at times it's been closed off from human traffic because of the damage being done to the drawings. Because rationalism. Oh. From its beginnings in cave paintings to the latest video on YouTube.com, visual communication has been a gateway to magic consciousness. Visual propaganda conveyed by motion pictures, television, and the internet are the modern day magic consciousness. Just as prehistoric cave dwellers evoke the spirit of the bison and the elk, the mass media propagandist is a shaman who silently evokes magical apparitions out of thin air into immediate presence. Visual propaganda is magic. Visual propaganda is fundamentally different from verbal propaganda, therefore, because it derives from an earlier, more primordial structure of consciousness. The visual aspect is a performance of magic, a direct pre-reflective penetration into one's being. The impact of visual propaganda is immediate, awe-inspiring, and transitory. It does not rely on speech for its effect, nor does it obey Aristotle's rules of rhetoric. It does not speak. It does not need interpretation. It simply is. Only with a mutation of consciousness to the mythic structure does the speaking mouth appear, which supplants the presence of nature with the spokenness of humans, and finally with the abstracting symbols of rational logic. Having established a theory of persuasion as either participatory, Protagoras, or absolutist, Aristotle, and a theory of visual communication as magic consciousness, Gebser, we have a framework to understand visual propaganda in the United States in the era of mass media. Western scholars cannot agree on a definition of propaganda. Their view is necessarily filtered by the events and values of their times. Propaganda is most overt and stakes are the highest during times of war. Consequently, propaganda scholars have tended to frame their understanding according to how propaganda was perceived during these times. The writings of three scholars represent the changing definition of propaganda in the United States during the 20th century, from World War I to World War II to the Cold War era. Edward Bernays was the so-called father of modern public relations in the United States. His context was the great mass media propaganda campaigns on both sides during World War I and also Freud's discoveries about the unconscious. For Bernays, propaganda is synonymous with public relations. 
a psychological manipulation of public opinion based on polling information. He said that propaganda is universal, continuous, and serves a positive organizing function in a modern democracy by providing guidance that citizens need to interpret current events, a modern rendering of Protagoras' persuasion, perhaps. However, only governments and large corporations could afford to hire public relations consultants, so propaganda is also elitist and top-down. Jacques Ellul was a French philosopher and law professor who wrote extensively about the technology, technological society. His context was the propaganda campaigns of World War II and the Cold War struggle between East and West. He wrote in 1965 that modern propaganda began in the democratic states, not in the totalitarian states, as is generally assumed, because the democracies had well-developed media and used psychological indoctrination. It is an irony that the totalitarian states learned their craft from the democracies. Regardless of the prevailing ideology, the propagandist cannot be a true believer. Indeed, the propagandist must manipulate ideology in order to justify his propaganda. Ellul also believed that the modern mass media caused information overload. The average citizen is not capable of correct interpretation, correct interpretation, and needs, indeed wants, propaganda to show the true way, a modern interpretation of Aristotelian absolutism. Noam Chomsky is an American linguist, philosopher, and political activist. He wrote in 1991, following the independence of Lithuania and demise of the Soviet Union, and the ascension of the United States as the lone superpower that propaganda, quote, Propaganda is to democracy as the bludgeon is to the totalitarian state, unquote. And that the mass media are primarily vehicle for delivering propaganda in the United States. Chomsky asserts two models of democracy. These might sound familiar. One in which the public actively participates and one in which the public is manipulated and controlled. The participatory model, of course, exactly parallels Protagoras' theory of persuasion. The controlling model of democracy exactly parallels Aristotle's theory of rhetoric. Chomsky says that while participatory democracy is espoused in the United States, in fact, the mass media are used to manipulate and control public opinion. The most dramatic evidence of media control is during times of war. Chomsky cited as the start of the era of media control in the United States, a government propaganda commission during World War I. Woodrow Wilson was elected US president in 1916 on a pacifist slogan, peace without victory. But he secretly wanted to lead the nation to war. So he hired George Creel, a public relations expert, to change the public's mind about war. Wake up, America! Civilization calls every man, woman, and child. Wake up. Within six months, the Creel Commission's propaganda turned the pacifist American population into hysterical warmongers who volunteered for military service in the millions. This uh, familiar for us figure of Uncle Sam personifying the US government, what had been in literature had been in words for many years, but it was not until the Creel Commission hired James Montgomery Flagg to paint his image that the icon was etched into the public mind. More than four million copies of this image were printed in magazines, posters, and song sheets during the Creel Commission's reign. This classic visual propaganda magically evoked the spirit of the nation. Like the ancient totem, the figure of Uncle Sam is speechless 
that specter directly and magically penetrates consciousness. The caption in the poster is superfluous in the power of the visual propaganda. The caption merely tells the view viewer how to act upon the impulse unleashed by the image. George Creel wrote a book entitled How We Advertised America about his successful campaign. He wrote it in 1920 following the war. Creel's propaganda achievements were taught at the time as an exercise of patriotism and an information service to the public. Chomsky views the real commission's Creel Commission's great accomplishment as showing how to use the professional mass media to control the U.S. public mind. Contrary to that, Mount Suribachi, this uh, famous photograph uh, was taken on February 23, 1945, during the ba Battle of Iwo Jima in the Pacific against the Japanese Empire. So, in other words, Fairly late in the war, it was a terrible battle, terrible in terms of cost, in terms of how long it stretched out. Fairly early on, the Americans um, got on shore and they first attacked this mountain because it was the high ground and that was the logic for a militarist was to capture the high ground. And there was some, some fighting, but uh, the battle went on for rage for another three or four weeks because it turns out the Japanese dug in into other areas of the island. But nevertheless, uh, the photograph was taken by Associated Press photographer Joe Rosenthal. Like the image of Uncle Sam, this visual propaganda speaks for itself. No words are needed. It was later used by Felix de Weldon to sculpt the 1954 Marine Corps Memorial that you see in the inset, which is located in Arlington Cemetery, the military cemetery in Washington, D.C. It did not seem to matter to anyone that the flag raising depicted in the photo was actually the second flag raising. There was a first one. Roosevelt's photo won the Pulitzer Prize, the highest achievement for journalists in America. The raisers of the first flag never received any recognition. Smart bombs. The iconic image of the heavily televised Persian Gulf War of 1990-91 was provided by video feeds from U.S. bombers launch, launching so-called smart bombs, which to me is a wonderful oxymoron, or guided munitions. Some video images came from the bombs themselves as they swooped in on their targets. What was smart about these bombs was not their precision in avoiding civilian casualties as compared to past wars because actually of all the bombs dropped, only 7.4% were smart in that sense. There was terrible loss of life. What was really smart about these bombs was the media spectacle that was being home to an eager television viewing audience. It looked like a shoot 'em up video game. The images were silent totems that played clean, blood bloodless entertainment. There were no explosion sounds when these happened on the screen. Television commentators asked news pundits whether our boys had learned their technology skills by playing video games. The public relations victory for the U.S. military was complete. This is Times Square in New York City, a famous uh, or, um, worldwide uh, renowned scene, I guess. As we look back in the history of U.S. propaganda, commercial, not political propaganda, as eloquently surveyed for you by Dr. Kramer, dominates our view. However, the overtop promotion of goods and services that we know today is a relatively recent phenomenon of only my lifetime. Though advertising and PR are huge, powerful propaganda industries in the United States, from a legal point of view, persuasion for commercial purposes was considered a privilege and not a right. 
of U.S. citizenship. Traditionally, there was a clear legal distinction between commercial speech and civil speech. The civil speech, talking about public affairs, was one of the issues for which the colonists revolted against Britain and protected it by the U.S. Constitution. Commercial speech, or in other words, advertising and public relations, did not have the same protection until nearly two centuries later. So a series of U.S. Supreme Court rulings known collectively as the commercial speech doctrine, this doctrine gave U.S. citizens the right to advertise, the right to propagandize. The reason that commercial speech doctrine arose when it did, of course, was to resolve the question, who will control the mass media? especially the visual media, and therefore who will control propaganda. American tradition of an independent professional media was eroded here, but it was not the government that took over the media, it was the media that took over the government. Seymour Hirsch represents a tradition of the independent <coughs> media, and um, his uh, career in journalism is marked by uh, two important news stories that were embarrassing to the United States. Me Lai was a slaughter of innocents during the Vietnam War, and uh, he broke the story, and um, one of the perpetrators was convicted of premeditated murder, but Richard Nixon, with his intercession, he was released after less than four years of house arrest. Then in 2004, he uh, broke a story in uh, New Yorker about Abu Ghraib, which uh, Dr. Kramer referred. Um, military's mistreatment of detainees at Abu Ghraib prison in Baghdad. He alleged that torture is a usual practice in U.S. military prisons. According to Elul, propaganda promotes an ideology of nationalism to make uh, torture excusable. Like me Lai, Abu Ghraib has been etched to the public consciousness by shocking photographs to release to the public, this time on the internet. Many of the images feature U.S. military reservist officer Lindy England taunting prisoners. Lindy England was arrested and was one of 11 personnel convicted in 2005 of conspiracy and uh, sexual, physical, and psychological abuse of prisoners. She was paroled after 521 days in prison and dishonorably discharged from the military. The public later learned that the so-called enhanced interrogation techniques had been authorized in advance by U.S. federal laws because the uh, ban on torture does not apply overseas. Saddam Saleh, a former prisoner at Abu Ghraib, is here showing a photograph of the abuse at a 2004 news conference. He's in the background of this image. And uh, this image of uh, Linda England having a cigarette dangling casually from her mouth became a uh, iconographic. Uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld ultimately was to blame, according to investigations, for the same shameful culture at Abu Ghraib, according to a 2008 investigation by a U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee. So in other words, legislatures investigated the executive. The report stated that Rumsfeld's policies, quote, conveyed the message that physical pressures and degradation were appropriate treatment for detainees, which they did not accept. 
a man named author Gary Winkler cashed in on the public's titillating fascination with these photographs and did an authorized bi biography of Lindy England. And uh, it was published by Bad Apple Books, LLC. In addition to re revealing England's thoughts and feelings, the author delves into torture policies of President Bush's administration that created a culture of abuse in Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and other prisons. There is a band called Abu Ghraib, a heavy metal band in San Francisco. They consider themselves performance artists, and they cashed in on the Lindy England propaganda. Quoting the band's website, the band consists of five Iraqi detainees forced by their handlers, the Desert Foxes, to perform pro-American death metal rants and other acts of humiliation. Throughout the show, attendees will be invited to hand off their cell phone cameras to the Foxes and to strike the iconic Lindy England pose, cigarette pose with the band for a keepsake of this historic event, celebrating our triumph over the forces of darkness, or in other words, the U.S. Army. And the quote, the aim of the performance is to, to fuse fascism through art, making the obscene scene, reviling the vile, unquote. Errol Morris, a famous award-winning award documentary film director, made a documentary film in 2008 that explores the meaning of the Abu Ghraib prison scandal photographs. Morris says his intent is to reveal that while Lindy England and the other bad actors are certainly not blameless, they were actually manipulated scapegoats to deflect attention away from the real culprits, the people in charge. He said, photographs reveal and conceal. They serve both expose and cover up. So we've come full circle, shall we say, that all the examples of US official propaganda examined have been by the professional media propagated, he propagating hegemonic ideologies, Aristotle's elitist authoritarianism. Occasionally, the propaganda is called into question or even co-opted by opposing members of the community, a suggestion that Protagoras' polis is not completely dead. And then we, in the age of the internet, the ruling hegemony no longer has total control over the media. The average citizen and grassroots activist groups can easily and cheaply produce their own visual propaganda and get a worldwide audience. So I'm going to just finish with a succinct example, vivid example. A case in point is a YouTube video that I queued up by Canadian musician Dave Carroll, who saw baggage handlers smash his guitar while sitting on the, in the airplane on the tarmac. He could look out the window, and they were uh, goofing around and uh, broke his guitar, worth $3,500. Carroll published a book, oh wait a minute, it's going to be a decade. He filed a damage claim with United Airlines, but the company said he was ineligible for compensation because he filed his claim incorrectly. After nine months of fruitless haggling, he decided to produce a protest music video and post it on YouTube.com in 2009. It amassed more than 150,000 views within one day, prompting a quick promise from United Airlines to pay up. Within four days of the video being posted online, United Airlines stock price fell 10%, costing stockholders about $180 million in trade value. Carroll published a book about his experiences and has a consulting business on customer relations now. <laughs> the German news service Tagesschau cited United Brakes Guitars as an example of a new kind of threat corporations face in the internet age. The video has been viewed by more than 13 million times. 
and we'll just give you the shortest viewing.